Um, so Screen Careers is a programme that's been delivered by Film Cymru Wales. Um, it's been funded by the, the Welsh Government via Creative Wales and the purpose of these events, some of you will have heard this four times already, um, but is very much to take you on that journey from creative to technical right through to uh, production and post-production. So today we're going to find out a little bit about how we move towards finishing a product in screen and what the roles are and what that entails. Um, we are going to try and myth bust. So if there's language that is industry heavy and doesn't really mean anything to you, we're gonna, I'm going to try and pick up on that so that we can explain terminology because often I think we hear, um, you know, what, what's a post-production runner? You know, what, what do they do? What's this, what's this particular role? And, and um, find out where you start out and how you can progress through. Um, I am really thrilled to be joined by some amazing industry speakers today. Um, they've kindly given their time up for screen careers. Um, so they're going to have some discussions with us. As Siobhan said, please don't be shy asking questions. Nobody has been so far. Um, so a big welcome to all of our speakers today on our post-production sales and distribution chat. Um, so can I ask you to introduce yourselves? I think I'm going to start with Rich. Hello, uh, I'm Rich Moss. I'm the Managing Director of Guerrilla Post-Production. Um, I was an editor. I think I still am. I don't think you really lose it, but um, I was an editor um, before non-linear, so I worked with videotape and then over to the non-linear systems like Avid and Final Cut and other systems. Uh, and uh, I was part of Pyramid Post-Production, then um, Monkey, post-production that we later rebranded to be Gorilla. So we've now got about a hundred edit suites um, from the one that we started with. And we do all forms of TV post-production from the offline, which is more your editorial uh, selecting editing to the finishing picture and sound of sound dubbing, color grading, visual effects, uh, and then the final delivery process of making the final final thing that gets delivered be it a tape or a file so we pretty much look after everything that there is post-production based uh, and being an ex-editor i kind of uh, come from that creative path that's now 50 50 technology and creativity brilliant thank you uh amy next i need not a technology-based person, I might add. <laughs> um, so I'm a post-production supervisor and I really kind of, I'm part of the production team and I, I work with everything kind of once it's left the floor or the location that you're filming and I manage that process. Um, I look after the budget, the schedule, and I work with the post-production house and, um, you know, we work together to get something over the line and into the broadcaster. That's brilliant. Thank you. Rebecca, can I move on to you? Welcome. Hello. Um, apologies in advance if my internet connection isn't very good. Um, but I'm also a post-production supervisor. Um, my current role, I'm working as a post-supervisor on Pennyworth uh, Season 2. So that's a DC Comics uh, Batman um, show that's running at Leavesden and feels very exciting. And prior to that, I worked on Alex Ryder, which seems to be really popular on Amazon at the moment, also as a post supervisor. Um, I have 17 years experience in film. I've been, I've had quite an unusual career where I've jumped around in production, distribution, exhibition. So whilst um, I'm here to talk about uh, post supervising, I can also talk a little bit to distribution and exhibition and sales because I have a little bit of experience in those. Um, uh, yes, and, and some of the places where I've worked over my career is, is the UK Cinema Association, which is a trade body for um, all the cinemas in the UK, um, Creative Skills Deluxe, uh, which is a big international post association. Uh, which is the trade body for all distributors in the UK. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll try and get some of those links up, actually, because they're really useful, I think, for people to have just to understand how things work. Thank you. And can I move on to Joanne? Nanda, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Joanne Ray, and I programme uh, films at Theatre Colwyn in North Wales. And that's the oldest working cinema in the UK. Um, my job involves choosing the films we show in, in two particular strands. Um, one is the non-mainstream, um, non-blockbuster films. So films not in the English language, uh, films from independent studios, art house films, etc. And the other strand I programme is films for people living with dementia. Um, and that tends to be classic films and musicals. Um, I started programming about 15 years ago. Um, I was actually working in marketing at the cinema. So that's telling people what we're showing and trying to get people through the door and get their money over the box office. And my passion for film led me into an opportunity for programming. Um, prior to that, I was a journalist specialising in, in film and, and the arts in general. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So much experience here that we're going to draw on. So, first of all, if I can start with Amy and just unpack a little bit in terms of post, what is post-production. So it goes in the can, essentially. And, you know, what are the key responsibilities in your job role with uh, in terms of delivering from script to screen? Okay, so um, the first thing that we really look at is the workflow. So, um, and that to a degree is dictated by who is showing the end product and what their requirements are. So, you know, you'll have a different workflow for a HD programme, high definition, or for UHD. And that kind of informs how we work, what cameras we use, what codec, you know, how, how everything's wrapped up basically, um, and how it's shot. So we get a workflow in place and we do that with the camera team. Um, we Can get I ask what, what is a workflow for those people who may not understand how the process works? It's, it's basically how we move the media from set. We get it backed up. We have to have it backed up several times now, now that we're working um, in a digital way, because the last thing you want to do is lose that. Um, <clears throat> and then it gets basically processed from the camera cards into whatever editing um, format you're going to be working on it in order to cut. Um, so that's kind of the first thing we do and we work with all the parties involved with that. So <clears throat> usually you have a digital lab on set um, and, and they'll be the person that take the cards, back them up, verify everything, make sure there's no immediate errors um, that they can see because obviously if you have an error then you, you know you might not be able to use that in your in your final cut um, and then that gets backed up and taken over to the edit house and then that gets um, transcoded so basically the files that you you film on are huge so those get compressed so that we can cut with them in a more efficient way um, and then our editors can get to work with that material so that's step one um, and then we'll have a period of assembly which you do whilst you're filming so it's just you work a day behind and you're just putting together the scenes that you've shot on any particular day um, and then once you finish filming you go into the fine cut so um, that's where you know everything gets kind of polished um, all the decisions in terms of editorial and how an episode is going to work get made at that point. Um, so I'm kind of in the background basically, um, just making sure that we're sticking to schedule. Um, we have to send cuts out for notes to various people. So it's just working with all, you know, all the editorial team um, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, the editorial is also sticking to the schedule and the budget that we have um, and also you know the communication really with the post house and sort of letting them know um, any key decisions that they may need to then kind of pick up and feed through into final post um, and then we go to final post basically um, which I'm sure Rich will be able to 
fill you in a lot more. Brilliant, uh, thank you. Um, I think that t that whole the business of film seems to be coming through in every session really that we've had. When you're talking about budgets, um, not just at the creative session, but every throughout budget and time are the things that really people have really kind of picked out. Thank you for that. So, Rich, can I ask you next? That seems a good segue. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, what was what was the question? So Everything we're talking. Right the question was we were talking about uh, the the key responsibilities in 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 the job role within the journey of delivering script to screen. So I mean, yeah, well, I suppose with with me, it's um. I mean, I'm I'm a managing director of the company, so I suppose I'll talk on kind of behalf of the the business. Um, you know, my managing director roles are the normal thing a managing director does with strategy and where the business is going. But because I come from a creative editor on the ground background. I'm also pretty much involved with workflows like uh, Amy discussed where we decide the best way of doing something because I think what's changed oh, probably over the last 10 years is we had a lovely period that um, everything stayed the same really. You know there was the offline period, there was finishing, we were all working in the same formats. We just suddenly had an explosion of you know, never mind HD, but then 4K, ultra high def, 8K, 6K, different sense. So, you know, it's all, we've brought in film and television into this one melting pot um, around scripted kind of high-end television um, where we do short uh, or rather we do low budget features that have less money than one episode of a television series. Mm. So, you know, there's such a huge difference and time and money is everything. And really, I think the, the um, what a post house needs to do and what a post supervisor's job role as well is to just make sure the money gets spent on the screen, uh, you know, and it's worthwhile and you can see it and it's not wasted in technicalities. So really as a post house, we, um, we work with post supervisors and productions and camera teams often before, before shoot start. And just, I think what Amy said, the, um, the key thing is, what's the end product? You've got to ask that question first, because so many people want to start with the biggest and the best or something that actually is really difficult to get to the end product or not worthwhile. So, so this streamlined workflow of when you make your low cost decisions, when you're going in really spending money, what you can do in parallel, whether you can be doing audio work while you're doing picture work. Because what you've got to remember as well is that the production team uh, are also all being paid for the period. So if you do one thing and then you move on to the next, you move on to the next, you're employing an awful lot of people for a long time. The more you can do in parallel at the same time, there's kind of less cost. So as a post house, we, um, we will deal with everything from the camera material coming into us to actually back up and turn into the lower form of, uh, of editing work. Then at the end of that, we will color grade, um, do visual effects, special effects work, uh, sound design, uh, the actual sound mix, additional dialogue recording. Um, but we can also do just individual parts of that because often a production will actually choose different post houses for the particular talents or the relationships. So we may only do the picture side or the delivery side while somebody else does the rest. So we also have to work with lots of other businesses, individuals in the process of making the final thing. Brilliant. So so much involved so much involved again i'm going to literally pick up on and be an absolute layman um you talked about color grading what actually does that mean within well the it's um it's something that's become so critical now back um i mean as it was in film really but when we started using videotape pretty much um what you saw on the camera uh, and the you know the camera people operating it, you know that's how it looked. You could then make it a bit darker, a bit lighter, a bit less green. These kind of controls, and that's what it was. Now, with the type of cameras that we're shooting on, we can shoot and capture pretty much all of the information that's out there, and then it all looks flat, if you like. 
but you've got every highlight, every low light, everything to play with. So in the color grade, um, in editorial, we tend to slap on a one look so that people can cut and everything looks roughly right. But then in the color grade, we can actually really set the scene and start telling the story. So it's not just about making the color look right or sunny mm. or darker, but actually trying to steer the action, you know, add suspense. We even get into, you know, vignetting and highlighting eyes or faces or replacing skies. So there's, there's a lot more to it, but generally it's where you just give a, give a film or a series the look that it's got, whether it is contrasty, shiny, gritty, mm. dark, but it's a very, very creative process. I was going to say that's such a, you know, you see post-production maybe sometimes as not being as creative as that beginning bit where the director is, etc. But that is actually, you know, contributing to the creative output in such a, an extensive way. It's, it's incredibly subjective, but critically important, really. The, the colorist, the person with that creativity, um, could be the difference of a series coming to a post house or not because that person is trusted and uh, you know lots of the big name colorists you know are as as famous and in demand as any director you could think of as well mm -hmm. so you know it really really is all about creativity brilliant thanks rich and rebecca if i can ask the same question to you about the key responsibilities in your job i know you obviously you've got a similar job to amy but if you could tell us a bit about your role or previous role Sure. So um, I, it's a very big program, Pennyworth. So yes, can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Can you hear? I great. Apologies. <laughs> um, so it's a very big uh, show, Pennyworth. So I work as part of a post team of probably twenty-five, which is five post managers. So there's a post producer, a post supervisor, myself, two post PAs and a post uh, coordinator. And then we have a team of 20 um, editorial, which are editors, uh, first assistant editors, assembly editors. There's quite a machine about the place. How I fit in, um, I'm exclusively responsible for the budget. So that's quite a, a heavy load to carry, I feel sometimes, um, but uh, also really interesting because you can move budgets around to make things happen. And as Richard said, you want to see the money go on screen. So as at the right time. So, you know, for example, at the moment, we're looking at VFX and how to maximize the resources we have to get, you know, the, the high visions that we have for the show on screen. Um, what I also do is, uh, the post producer does the schedules actually, um, mm. but I help move the schedules around according to uh, how things change. So a schedule is never fixed, but you're always having to move things around to, to make, um, to, to fit in with everyone's flexibility and what they need to do. Um, I also recruit, uh, I look after equipment, so every editor needs an Avid, um, and in the time of COVID, we've not been able to go to our post houses and go and watch content with the producers, with the network, so we've had to build two playback rooms, so two mini cinemas essentially with 5.1 sound and high quality screens, so that's taken a lot of organising. Um, and then yes, in, in the rest of my job, it's really, you know, following the schedule, liaising with the editors, organising director reviews, network reviews, a lot of our decision makers and, uh, and uh, colleagues at Warner Brothers TV are based in America, so we, we find the sort of overseas way of, of being able to review content together, um, which is interesting in itself. Um, and yes, we work, I also work with the VFX team. Uh, we work with a company called Coza VFX, who are based in LA and Vancouver. Um, and then we also go through sound design, sound mix. Um, uh, it's, and, and yes, and then we have a whole set of deliverables at the end, which we're starting to get into now. So 
yes, it's quite an extensive list. I hope you could all hear me as I was explaining. Yeah, that. no, it's great. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to come back and ask you all some more questions uh, shortly, particularly around some of the technology you use. And I know uh, all of you at one point will recruit. So I know we'll have loads of questions about what you're looking for. So I'm going to come back and ask you a couple of those. Thanks, Beck. If I can move on to Joanne. So all of this fabulous post work is done. Um, what, how, how do you make the decisions as to what goes on your screen in your cinema? What's your role involve? So my job is to ensure that each season we have a really well thought out list of films in our brochure that offer alternatives to, to mainstream films. Um, to get to that final list, it's a, a rolling process all year round for me. I'm a total 100% film geek. Absolutely crazy about it. Uh, always have been since I was a child. So I love the process all through the year of finding out what's coming out for release, reading reviews, reading film publications, sight and sound, white lies, etc. Um, reading industry websites of, of releases that are coming up to make my list, which usually starts sort of 90 films or something. And then I'll try and whittle it down. Um, I have to take a number of factors into consideration when I'm, I'm making that final list. I hate to say it, but money is a, a consideration. Um, how much will it cost to show that film? So that's the deal that's done with the distributor versus how much we're going to make in ticket sales. What, what do we think we can make from this film? Um, I need to consider if it's a film that will make people leave their homes when you've got so much to watch on streaming now and, and various platforms and now TV and Apple TV, why will they come out to the cinema to watch it? What, what experience are they going to get um, that's different from what they'll get at home? Um, if, it, if it's a film that's getting a lot of press and lots of social media talk, then that really helps. I'm thinking of uh, Parasite, the Bong Joon-ho film. That won lots of awards, so people were aware of it. You put it in your program. Oh, I've read about that on Facebook or Twitter. Oh, yeah, and it's on. Okay, okay, that you know, helps lure people out. So you're thinking of films that have got something to to get people out their front doors. Um, you want that awareness um, from your audience, if possible. Um, you you sort of get to to know your audiences after you've been working at a place for a few years. Um, you develop an understanding of, of what they what they like. You can study ticket sales. Um, you can spot the ones that do well, which genres, which directors, which actors. Our audience loves Ken Loach films and they love French films. They're not so keen on zombie films, just off the top of my head. Um, but the opposite is how can I make them come to a zombie film? Um, that, that requires a lot of thought. Um, some programmers do the agreement with the, the deal with the film distributor. Um, I don't personally, but that's the stage where you'll um, negotiate how much you're going to give them from your box office receipts um, and what they'll charge you to show the film. Um, and I also run post-show screening talks with, with talent that's willing to come up to the North Wales coast um, so you give a bit of extra added value to your, your audience. That's one of the things that helps get them out, um, out of their front doors to come to your cinema. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've not talked a lot about audience. We've talked about creativity and development and production and post-production. Um, how difficult is it to get new audiences is in to see films, um, you know, based where you are is that one of the main challenges or um it, it is a really tough challenge we've got the sea on one side and we're surrounded by mountains and hills it's quite a, a small population um it's something that you have to work at you can't do it uh, as you could do in a city maybe mm -hmm. over a few months you've really got to put years into developing that that audience you've got to put a lot of work into it but you have to try it I remember we showed Pan's Labyrinth, this was years ago when it was first out. We had 
a lot of people who'd never seen a film that wasn't in English before. And I got so many messages through the box office from the audience saying, I am so glad you recommend that we come and see that. I'm so glad you have that in the programme. It was one of the best films I've ever seen. I never would have seen it unless you were showing it and we trust it's brilliant. what you put on for us. And that makes you think that's worthwhile. That person's got something new in the, in the creative world that they love because you led them to it. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about um, careers with everybody, but I wouldn't mind coming back to talk a little bit about some of the technical and editing software that you use, because I'm, I'm sure we'll have questions about that um, in terms of people who want to move into post-production, uh, maybe starting with Rich, um, the type of technology and the type of software that you use as industry standard. Well, I think in broadcast television today, the industry standard is avid. 99% uh, of everything really is, is avid. Um, saying that, um, we do an awful lot of work, kind of behind the scenes work, social work, web where people are, are using Premiere uh, and, and Resolve. So there's kind of two camps at the moment. I think um, Resolve is getting used a lot more now as well, certainly in colour grading. My dog's just turned up by the side of me. This is a awkward. good addition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but um, certainly for the editorial side, um, Avid is pretty much uh, the main kind of tool. But as I tell most kind of editors, editing is a, is a skill. I, I've, I've edited on film, on videotape, beat recipe, digibeta, one inch, then on to Lightworks, Avid. But, you know, it's, um, once you edit, it's pretty much a two-day course to switch over to another platform uh, and then it's just about speed so I wouldn't be too worried about um, editing platforms because I think things will change but certainly um, if you know Avid that's, um, that's certainly good into the, the kind of broadcast TV world. Brilliant thank you. Amy anything to add to that? Not really. I think, I don't know if Rebecca uses anything. I think for our side of things, it's really a case of just being familiar with all the different technologies that would be involved in a post process and, um, you know, having a degree of familiarity so that you can um, work with post house to schedule stuff and just, you know, find different ways of doing things really. Mm. How about you, Rebecca? Yeah, we're all on AVIDs for sure, all our editors. What the sort of technologies that we spend a lot of time looking at right now is, is around remote editing and how to make that happen. So, of course, we all have a, a plan. You know, some of our editors have worked from home, actually, and have had at-home mm. setups. Um, and the challenge for us then is making sure that we're all communicating effectively, that the, the content and the workflows are all working properly. And also on the online side of things. So once picture is locked and we're, we're looking at the grade and, and uh, sound, um, you know, there's, it took quite a while to figure out whether we were using a system called Clearview or a system called Evercast. And these are essentially ways of connecting where you are um, up with your post house so that you can all look at work together at the same time. Mm. And actually it's been a really... We know we're innovating and finding new ways of working in ways that haven't happened before, but it's it's been quite a process to get it right. I mean, I can't say how many times we've we've had Clearview up and then we've had to get Teams up, um, um, Microsoft Teams, so that everyone can communicate with each other while they're looking at the work. And of course, everything needs a pattern. A really new challenge for everyone in post production, I think, making sure that we can all get on with the job, even if we're not all together. Mm. Um, I don't know if anyone else has had this experience recently. Rich, Rich I'm sure, uh, <laughs> I think you said that's been on your mind a lot. And uh, I'm sure there's been lots of challenges uh, with, for everybody. Thanks, Rebecca. That's brilliant. I was just also wondering, obviously, I know that you've had quite an extensive career and quite varied in terms of sales and distribution as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that for anyone who's interested in that area? Yeah, sure. And I mean, I was, uh, you know, 
to make it very clear, I mean, post-production and sales and distribution and exhibition, they sort of happen in that order. So whilst we're here in a panel talking about post-production and film release, it's actually, once the film leaves the post house, the film has a long way to go and touches a lot of people and goes through a lot of processes before it hits your screen, whether at home or in cinema. Um, I think it might be helpful. I mean, I had a job a few years ago where I was working with a producer called my producer, and she gave me quite a hybrid job where I was working not only as a post supervisor for her, but also um, I was I, she called me a media asset supervisor, which essentially was that I was looking after uh, the creation of the trailers for six, mm. she gave me six of her films to to get through post and to um, get over to sale a sales company we were working with so there's media assets a trailer um, or promo which is a slightly longer version than a trailer mm. um, a social media assets for promoting the film online and social media cut downs which are shorter versions of the of the trailer um, and they, they were sort of a, a marketing packet um, together with all the deliverables that each film had. So when you deliver a film to a sales company or a distributor, you're not just delivering the film itself, you're delivering a list of probably around 55 different things. And that includes the film in the variety of formats that, that it comes in or the, or the, the, the TV um, show. Mm. It could be poster artwork, it could be um, music and effects files, it could be an electronic press kit, it could be biographies, it could be music cue sheets. I mean, I'm happy to explain what any of those things are, but there's just to highlight, there's a whole list of things that come with delivering a film. Um, but it was important for me to deliver all this to the sales company because to talk a little bit about sales, the sales companies, uh, they're quite a niche part of the, the film value chain, let's call it. Um, last time I counted, there were about 25 sales companies and most of them based in London. But they, you know, they do so much. They, what they will do is buy the, the film off the producer and represent that film in festivals and markets so that the film can be sold to distributors which is the next part of the chain so sales if you like they 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 have a sales agreement where they uh license the film and then they're selling it to distributors who know their own territories around the world and they're going to sell it to to their parts of the world if that makes sense so i think there are nine where a film can be sold. Um, in terms of a sales company and the departments within it, you have an acquisitions department where, um, and these are the people who are looking for new films to buy, that um, they're always reading like the, the trade press or screen and international variety, looking for the latest film from the latest directors and trying to get in there first to be able to buy it. Um, they're selling those films to distributors. There's a, there'll be a very strong marketing department, so promoting the new titles that they have to distributors. And there will be technical people as well who will be looking at creating promos and making sure that a film delivers safely from, uh, from the post house to the sales company. So different jobs you could have in sales, uh, uh, sales marketing um, or um, internship. That's sort of summarised sales companies and then there's also a distribution side to that as well. I don't know if we have time for me to quickly We do, we that, do, because it's really interesting um, here in the bread. Well, it'd be interesting to know what type of roles are available in sales that maybe you could say that people may have not even have thought they existed. Or Definitely, existed. so there's sort of uh, sales, uh, there, there are actually sales companies work on a, on a process where they like to take interns on a rolling basis because they like to test people out I think. If you're really good and you're really passionate and I think the skills in a sales company could be the ability to analyse a script, um, business relationships. One biggie could be digital marketing because you know I think as 
young people come through, they bring in with them a sort of native digital experience that more senior people in sales and distribution companies might not have. So, you know, even working on Pennyworth now, we've, we've been using our, one of our um, post PAs uh, to help us with some marketing ideas and it's, it's worked really, really well. So that's definitely something unique that you could bring to the table. Um, also, um, languages could also be beneficial because sales agents, they, they are traveling the world in different festivals like, uh, like, um, Cat, like the Marche in Cannes, uh, the European film market in Berlin, um, and representing the film at festivals from Sundance, Toronto, Venice, Tribeca. I mean, it's such an exciting part of the industry to be in, but uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a small part of the industry to be in, so you really need to fight if you want to be a, a part of, of that uh, part of film. But those opportunities are different. Um, so I would say sales agents, interns, uh, marketing, assistants, these are all realistic opportunities um, in sales. Yeah. And also, you know, there, there are training schemes out there as well that young people can access. So I would definitely look at um, uh, the FEDS training program, which is Film Education Distribution Sales, um, and, and see if, if that program runs and uh, where those opportunities are. It used to be a collaboration between film sales, distribution and exhibition run by um, the Film Distributors Association and the Independent Cinema Office. Mm. Um, these are I'm losing you a little bit there, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Rebecca? I'm having a few problems with Rebecca. Perhaps we should uh, move on. No. No worries. Um, Rebecca mentioned um, what Rebecca mentioned there. We're going to put in our fact sheet as well. Um, we'll include that in the end because um, that sounds like something really interesting. If anybody uh, wants to know how to access that program, Beck, you're back. Can you hear me? I'm back. I'm spotty. I'm very sorry. It's huge Don't apologies. Don't worry. So Don't worry. It's, <laughs> the, it's the nature of this, right? Um, and just finally, really, to ask you, you know. You're from Ponty Preeth, just up the road. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. from Cardiff. Um, so amazing career progressions. What was the catalyst for for the career path that you're on now? It all happens because I was working at the National Assembly for Wales, probably nearly 20 years ago, and a recruitment agency rang me and said Richard Attenborough was looking for someone to uh launch the launch of Dragon Studios in South Wales, the, the concept of Dragon Studios. So to cut a long story short, I ended up working in a film academy at the University of Glamorgan, where we were developing film courses for uh, Richard Attenborough's studio, and eventually those courses would move in there. Um, that was the catalyst really. I, I'm a languages graduate. I'd never intended to, to work in film and never had the idea, but it was just that little events spin that mm. catapulted me into film. And once I was in film, I was always very curious about the whole industry, not just different parts of it. Because I think it's safe to say most people, the majority of people will find their niche, whether it's production, sales, distribution, exhibition, and they will stay in that part of the industry and they'll grow and progress and have a really successful career. But by no design, I jumped around from different parts. And so I'm very happy to have a good overview in film. But after you know, 17 odd years, I, it was only uh, last year that I jumped over into TV, um, rightly or wrongly. And that's been a really refreshing experience because I didn't know those networks and so mm -hmm. it's been nice to be able to get to know a new set of people you know people do jump back and forth from film mm -hmm. and television now which is brilliant but just stepping away from the UK film industry was uh, a refreshing time of change for me I think in uh, in all good ways. Brill thank you so much Rebecca and um, 
can I ask, um, moving on to talk a little bit about pathways and entry level roles into getting into what, what you guys do. Uh, Joanne, you talked particularly about your passion for film, um, which I'm, I'm guessing that everybody has on our panel. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about the pathway into doing your role? Um, from my experience, it, it, it's slightly not easier you can go you can walk off the street into your local independent cinema and speak to the programmer and tell them about yourself and how much you love cinema i don't know if you could do that with any of the the jobs on the panel mm -hmm. maybe it's more accessible um okay. as, I, as i mentioned earlier i came into it by a, a strange route through marketing at the cinema and they found out i was a film geek and offered me the chance to program i was incredibly lucky but um, for, for younger people in particular, I would suggest going in and, and starting at the front door of the cinema, going in and getting a job at your cinema. Uh, you're not so much multiplex, I don't think it would work there, but an independent cinema on, on the high street. Um, selling tickets, working in the bar, get your foot in the door one way or the other. Get to know the programmer show them that you're passionate, come up with some draft um, program ideas, draft mm -hmm. after season um, of films that you would like to show if you have had that opportunity. Um, be, don't, don't be rejected if they say no the first time, keep going back. Um, maintain that passion for film and, and really communicate that to them. Um, I don't think you need a degree to be a, a film programmer. Um, just to be incredibly passionate and knowledgeable about, mm. about what you're doing. Um, the Independent Cinema Office, as I mentioned earlier, they do some great programming courses. I've, I've done one, yeah. a course with them. I would really recommend them. Um, I think we've just put that in the uh, chat as well. We'll make sure it's on the fact sheet, the ICO. Okay. I mean, once, once, you, once you've got your foot in the door and you've got uh, your, your opportunity to program, I mean, like myself, I stayed at the cinema i'm committed to that venue i absolutely love the place um but you at the bigger cinemas with multiple screens not a chain multiplex and you're still independent you've got more opportunity to program more screens wider scope you can do more add-on events talks and seasons and festivals at, at a cinema or you could progress on to working on festivals um so many people do that and it's a lot of freelance work so if you don't want to be tied to one particular project you could work in freelance programming you can program from cardiff for a festival in canton in in china um over the internet it's you don't have to actually work in that in that country to be involved in programming but i think the, the main thing is to be to be passionate and knowledgeable Brilliant, thank you. That's really, really useful. Rich and Amy, I'm going to come back to you both, so I don't mind. Um, maybe you could both chip in on this. Can you tell us a bit about industry and progression opportunities? What kind of a basic career pathway would be, um, as well as maybe telling us what you look for? Three questions face, Amy? There. <laughs> There's about well, three questions in there. Sorry, go on, Rich. Well, um, from from my side of post production, um, I think the um, what we look for really is is just a good knowledge of post production. It's it's very different to production and being in front of the camera, behind the camera, and being out on location. Although in a large post production company, um, you do end up doing a lot of different things. There are opportunities for you know we've done robotic camera links one born every minute you know lots of media managing so it is a real nice blend of technical and creative but you do need a technical background and we do we do look for that just even if you you know understanding spreadsheets and documents and totally familiar which everybody pretty much needs to be to do anything nowadays anyway but then um we actually had a big seminar a few weeks back about you know is the role of the runner dead now is it the entry way in or is it not and i still think it is certainly for us every runner that we've ever taken in 
has always moved on. We've got a policy of we will only keep a runner for two six-month periods because we want to bring on other runners. And um, they've either moved uh, into technical operations, sound pictures, or they moved on to production mm. or other companies. And pretty much most of my senior creative team were runners um, from, uh, from the company when we started. Uh, certainly my own career path was I went in as a, as a kind of a runner in a, in a small post house and then worked my way up from that. And it was, it was quite easy when you move around. But mm -hmm. I think it's really important when you go in that you're not, I am going to be this editor. Just experience it. You really just meet. And I think this is something where homeworking, fantastic, but it's, it's not what creativity is all about. If you can be in a, a big, busy post house and you've got, uh, you know, you've got directors round the pot making a cup of tea that you can have a chat to while other things, you know, it's a really vibrant, creative place. Mm -hmm. And I think people often think they want to be an editor and end up deciding, oh, I really like that and go off to it. And, and we've seen just this, we've had, um, you know, even receptionists on our reception. Uh, one's gone through sound, one's gone to production. One is now quite senior um, mm. technical person that's now going into VFX, visual effects editing. So, you know, it's really nice to, um, to just get an experience of, uh, mm. of everything. And I think if you start on the, um, the technical side of a post house, which is like um, dealing with, people's media, backing it up, logging. You just learn so much about camera codecs and formats and everything else that there is. But you also just learn diligence and how important you are and where you fit in the workflow chain. Uh, and because you are dealing with people who are running around with their heads on fire or screaming or upset or late, you just learn how to just deal with them with the business as well. And from there, you can decide, I really want to be a colorist. I really want to go off into sound design. I'd like to be something. So I think whatever you do, if you've got that technical underpinning mm. where you kind of understand things, you can really move anywhere. That's brilliant. Thank you. A couple of things we haven't touched on, actually, because I know there's a couple of people who were here uh, earlier on and yesterday talking, who were very interested in sound. So I'd be doing them a disservice if I didn't ask about what are the roles in sound post? Well, in post-production, um, generally get your sound mixer. That is the person that puts it all together and does the final mix. Um, then the only other real separation then is the, the sound editing side, which can break up into many other things, but is often done by, uh, by the same type of person, like your uh, offline editor or your assistant editor and your offline editor, your online editor. So um, uh, there's sound effects editing, there's dialogue editing, there's additional dialogue recording where you're actually you know, drawing, acting uh, out of people to review things. There's, um, uh, there's Foley work, of course, which is a complete uh, black art and wonderful creative art by itself where you're reconstructing sound effects. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different avenues, but often people will specialise. Sound design is something that... Um, you know, it has more of a specialism with it, but certainly in in Gorilla, in my company, um, our kind of team, our sound department, they will do Foley work, they will do dialogue editing, they will do sound effects editing, and by doing it all, um, you know, they just understand everything and they know what's needed, and it's a great progression onto mixing. But actually mixing isn't the be all and end all as well, because there are fantastic dialogue editors, sound effects editors with careers, you know, and a following by themselves. So, you know, it's quite a large um, department with sound. Mm. And then before you even get into, you know, the very other technicalities of the stereo sound mixing, there's 5.1 sound mixing. There's now Dolby Atmos where you're throwing 
throwing images around the back of your head and round again. So, you know, there's always progression. There's a, there's a core art, but then there's always something new and there's always something new to learn. And is it, or is it about keeping on top of that? Because the technology is moving so quickly, would you say? Yeah, I think the same is true with every job. You've got to keep on top of it. And that just, if, you know, if your natural interest is to always, you know, be the best, always know what's happening, you know, you have to move forward. But really, as long as you've got the basic underpinning, things haven't changed that much in terms of the, the art, in terms of the craft of what you're doing. It is only technology that changes massively. Mm. So, um, you know, but it is good to, you know, to be a part of all that and know what's around the corner. Brilliant. So the technology changes all the time, but the type of person who goes into post-production probably doesn't. So Amy or Rebecca, I don't know which one of you wants to pick it up, but what type of person do you think works in post, whether it be sound or image? What are you looking for? Um, if we're talking new entrance, I mm. think I was just thinking about the post assistants that we have and definitely it's always the attention to detail, uh, the, the enthusiasm to do a lot and more um, and being a, I think a big thing with them is prioritization. So I'm talking soft skills here, but prioritization I think is massive because in whatever uh, role you're performing in post-production everything's on a schedule and on a budget and you have to keep on top of that and that's a really hard thing to do when there's millions of things happening at the same time um you know so so those are the soft skills i would describe i, I don't know if amy you want to embellish on the the more specific skills to post-production um i mean in addition to that i would say um just having an understanding of the bigger picture and how how the knock-on effect of everything because everything is very interconnected and so if one thing changes something else you know inevitably that has an effect on something else and that will affect something else and so just I think you know being able to kind of just stand back and understand how linked everything is um you know and making the time to kind of have that overview um yeah and just you know enthusiasm and willing goes a long way mm. and being flexible and being you know able to kind of stick mm. it get stuck in you know with anything that's thrown at you I think you started in the production office didn't you yeah moved over to post-production so is that a good way to do that do you think um I think sort of from an organizational side like Rebecca and I are in very much so I think that's mm. probably quite a traditional route for post supervising I would say um I think it's a really useful route because I I sort of understand what's going on with the filming you know kind of where people's heads are at and what their priorities are because I think you know post post-production is if we don't get that right, then we do all the work that kind of leads up to it, a massive injustice. So mm -hmm. it's really important to always be focused that that is on the horizon. But, you know, there's such a massive number of mountains to climb before you, before people are even really at that point. So, you know, it's, I think it is really helpful to mm -hmm. have had that experience to understand the kind of day to day things that, you know, the production are sort of dealing with, um, so you know how you can kind of fit in with that and, you know, yeah. So, but across the board, I think, you know, Rich is right. Basically entry level for all of these things. I think, you know, running is just such a fantastic way to go in. I cannot emphasize enough how much getting work experience as well when you're, you know, when you're studying or any opportunity that you can get to get anywhere near anything really you know that's part of the process will just inform you and help you to see what's out there because if you've not been near a, a film set or if you've not been in a post house you just you don't know what the day-to-day -day kind of you know mm. roles involve so I think just taking those opportunities and absorbing as much as you can and just sort of understanding how everything fits together I think is absolutely you know the best thing to do really. Thank you. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Rebecca? I think a really good resource 
Oh, look, I jumped in too soon. I was going to say that a really good resource is the Creative Skills Set website, now called Screen Skills. Um, the Screen Skills website have lots of job roles and new entrant roles and really breaks down what kind of skills you need and what's out there. Um, so that's a good um, tool to use. And the also thing, having thought about all the different types of training or experiences you can access, I think one of the best is to find a mentor. So if you do find some work experience and are lucky enough to, to, to go through that and you see someone who really inspires you, people are, in the industry are often quite flattered when they're approached and someone says, oh look, I'd really love to you know, learn from your experience your time in that way. So I would really recommend if there's someone who really inspires you, then you know, just think if, about whether you could potentially approach them. Not to say approach everybody, but you know, they, I think mentoring is a is a two way thing that is rewarding for the mentor and rewarding for the mentee as well. So yeah. there are lots of training schemes set up out there that that facilitate that as well. But uh, sometimes you can get them through your own hard work as well. That's great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I could go on asking you questions for ages, all of you, but I'm going to have to hand it over to the audience so they can ask questions. Um, can I uh, just hand over to Siobhan, um, because I think people may want to ask some questions. Hi, yeah, thanks Faye, um, and thanks to you and the panel. I think this has been such an interesting discussion. I've really enjoyed listening along. Um, now over to the Q&A portion. So hopefully you at home, you've been storing up your brilliant questions for our panel. I think with with universities, it's pretty much the same as every course that um, you just need to do your research and just see what the success rate of those courses are. You know, is it uh, is it the type of course that actually you know is renowned for that particular type of media and and jobs from it? Um, also, you know, if you really know which genre it is that you like, then um, just make sure you've got the opportunities for that kind of specialism, that it's not too just um, too wide, uh, you know, and you can go into to certain aspects of it. And then I just think that if um, the other thing that's quite critical is whichever course you choose, just have a look at what um, post-production companies there are and what opportunities there are in that area, because it would be great if you could make contacts you know, even before you get into uni and just know that you've got that idea of work experience or can you go in, you know, is there a post company anywhere near where you are or, uh, you know, is it a complete dead zone? So that might be quite useful to, um, to see that you've got those opportunities. Everyone who spoke over the last four sessions has talked about research, 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 know what's going on, know what's happening. Um, and it just seems that that's really, really important. I'll start off more um, more because uh, we kind of get involved with um, uh, production ideas and um, you know and scripts early on and I've seen scripts come into us that we've started costing on working on that have uh, paused or stopped and not gone any further and others that have come back and a lot of it is around the commissioning and for instance now in COVID um, you know, people are looking for expansive escapism. Um, while, you know, the country is down, people want to be uplifted. I remember when we started uh, Stella, actually did about six series of that years and years and years ago. And that was Sky really making a decision for comedy. You know, everything's just getting a bit rubbish in this country. Let's have a smile. So, you know, there are actually um, demands for things that are actually, you know, you can see something happening globally and uh, and you can just get a grip on, right, I can see now what people are going to want. Uh, silly things as well, like um, uh, studio availability, you know, are there studios, is there more, um, and I'm not just talking about scripted uh, kind of genre here now, but, um, you know, we've seen a massive uplift in documentary series now, and actually what we've seen is an uplift in demand for content. 
I mean, now, because it's amazing just seeing what happens when an industry not even shuts down, but slows down for a period. Um, the demand for content is just massive. So I think you can just see trends in your normal, in your normal life. But then how that changes from country to country, I'm sure, is um, probably more of a Rebecca question and, um, and film distribution and, and deals and ideas. But that's kind of um, what I've seen from, um, you know, from my post side anyway. Thank you, Rich. Beck, do you want to add to that? Uh, well, I was just really thinking more broadly than that. And I was thinking when there are trends in film, actually you're already too late when you see the trend starting and if you were a film producer thinking okay everyone's watching comedy so i'm gonna watch comedy by the time you actually make your film in all likelihood that trend will have passed because i think a, a few i don't know if it's still the same but a few years ago um i was told it takes seven years on average to get a film from script to screen um, and that you needed seven good films on your slate for one to get through and be made. But the, talking in independent films, so the statistics are quite tough looking at how films are getting made in the independent world. Um, but then, you know, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is you may have, you, you know, you can't just suddenly react and say, I'm going to catch on this trend because you can't deliver almost immediately. Um, in terms of who's watching what around the world, I think that's too big a question for me. <laughs> I wouldn't know if it's that. <laughs> I'm watching Shit's Creek at the moment because it's it's funny and we all need a laugh. So that's what I'm watching. <laughs> Brilliant. Paulina's actually put something really great in the chat as well um, about how to keep uh, up to date with what distributors are buying. So um, do have a look at that as well. Yeah in terms of looking at film festival market guides, but also trade press as well. You know, that's what's um, right at the front of what's going on. Um, so Pauline's mentioned Screen Daily, Variety, Hollywood Reporter. Um, we'll put all of these in the fact sheet. The fact sheet will be sent um, to, will be available for everyone who's attended the sessions um, and I think Siobhan am I right in saying that the, all of the sessions have been recorded so they will all be online at a later date edited down yeah yeah so if you haven't seen all yeah. of the sessions then absolutely you can you can watch them back that was a question um, from someone so this is from Joe to Rich what is the best way to get work experience in a post-production house uh, I swell phone up again research it's always good to get a name <laughs> i'm saying this now with my name up there knowing what's gonna come but um uh do some research get a name because it may not even be um you know the boss of that you know it might be the, the senior colorist or the, the the dubbing mixer you know whichever thing you're really interested in. get hold of somebody i mean linkedin you know the the normal methods um, and just try to make contact because if I was giving you the, the company line, because we get so many requests, it all goes to our HR department. They've got a huge calendar, first come, first serve. They try to find slots. They be fair. Um, we used to take people on for quite long periods of work experience, but I think, um, and I, I don't really agree with this, but one of the dangers of growing into a big grown-up company like we are now is that we've got to be very careful that we're not using people as well. Now, I would never see taking on somebody for a, a month and giving them a good view as free labour and used, but actually, you know, in kind of policy guidelines, um, we've got to start paying people after a week. So um, what we tend to do is three days work experience on a particular thing and try to give as many people a chance to, to come in as possible. So, um, you know, do some research, find a name, uh, you know, drop a, drop a message in, speak on the phone. I think if you're, um, you know, the type of right passionate person and you know what you want, there's always a way of getting bumped up because the problem we get certainly as a, a fairly large company is there's a lot of people that just need work experience 
and they come through anonymously, you know, as a tick box, I need work experience. It's all valid whether they want work experience in post-production or not, but we get full of a lot of people that aren't necessarily, I'm desperate to work in post-production. So if you've got a chance to get that over with a covering letter, with a conversation with something, then, you know, there is a bit of a filtering process to get the people that really want to come in a chance to come in. So I suppose what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, <laughs> send me an email, let me know, and I'll see if I can, uh, I can bump you up the list. But it's always nice as well to hear from people, um, you know, to see what, what their, you know, real um, interests are. So, you know, I, I really am genuinely keen to hear from people as well, because this industry does change every week. And, uh, you know, we might not be looking for people, then all of a sudden, oh, we really need to train somebody up to be a VFX assistant or something different. So it is definitely useful to just um, keep in touch and keep nagging. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, Kimberly in the chat has put up a link to the BFI Statistical Yearbook, um, which is also a really useful resource just to understand what's going on in the industry, how many films are being made, who's doing what, what organisations are involved. So we'll, again, we'll make sure that that is included uh, on the uh, fact sheet as well. Um, I think I'm okay to say... I think, I'm going to say it anyway, um, that Rich has offered for Gareth to go in um, and have a bit of a uh, look around Gorilla when it's opened, um, if, if I'm right in saying that. Yeah, I mean, kind of tours and, and just chats, you know, coming in, have a look around, 10 minutes, have a chat about the industry, that kind of stuff's easy. That's nothing we've got to go through. I say it's easy, not particularly easy during lockdown and and COVID, and we don't really want to be inundated with uh, with strangers. But I can always even come out and have a coffee on the park bench and uh, and have a chat about things. But um, having a look around the uh, the building, it's it's something actually we want to do a lot more of. But um, really, this is something that we're um, we're talking to Screen Alliance Wales with as well, and just trying to have a, a concerted way of if there's going to be a tour of the facility, it would be lovely to have twenty or thirty people in. Uh, and, and give people a look and do it in that way but um but certainly you know just um having five minutes and coming in having a quick chat and uh here's a look around is something that we should be able to manage off the radar rich thank you so much that's an incredibly kind offer um and if gareth connects to lloyd uh film Cymru wales then he can arrange it i really do feel like a screen industry still a black right here gareth says thank you very much it's an outdated cultural reference, I think. So I, I guess it, the, the reality of the situation right now is that it is a little bit more challenging than it would have been uh, for people to get experience. There are sessions like this um, sort of run across the country. So I think it's a really good way to connect with people and get work experience. It's worth uh, looking at things like Rich mentioned Screen Alliance Wales, also Skill Cymru does apprenticeships. Um, so BBC also does apprenticeships and will be doing some next year. I think there are, someone said earlier in an earlier session, 20 productions filming in Wales, um, you know, high-end TV productions filming in Wales next summer. Uh, more's filming because less filmed last year. So we're hoping 2021 is going to be amazing. I'm always looking for someone who's done three or four days on a BFI course. It's such a great way to get into the industry. You know someone's been on a set, they've been practical, things like It's My Shout, you've got an understanding of the industry. So the one thing I will say, and this is just like a general, general piece of advice, so many CVs you read and someone's done like three weeks work experience at the BBC and they've put it right at the bottom of their CV. It needs to be at the top of your CV. So make sure that if you do have any practical experience in the industry, that that's going to the top. Um, it may not be necessarily what you're doing right now. Uh, it's my shout link is in the chat as well, but make sure that your experience is right up front. Yeah, please. It's, it's, that's just such a good question. It's just made me wonder whether there's, anything we can do on a remote side with mm. with what we do the, the danger at the moment between now and christmas of um of bringing people in is we've got quite a few very important productions in 
that are getting COVID tested daily and the impact of, you know, somebody with COVID in our building would be catastrophic, really. So I think all risk is, uh, is trying to minimise the number of people in, which does mean, I mean, I'm just thinking of all of our bookings, coordinators, kind of post-producers, they're all, um, all working across teams. We've pretty much always got one in the building and four outside same with our kind of technical team. We've got a couple on the ground and nine others um, all outside using teams. And I'm just trying to think aloud whether there's anything, maybe not quickly, but I should start thinking about the ability to give kind of virtual experience. You know, even our editors are working remotely. You know, there's security issues, but screen sharing with directors and, you know, if people can be mentored to just watch in and ask questions, certainly on the, the kind of assistants and the tech operators and the post producers, I'm going to have a think about, um, you know, whether there is a way to offer kind of a day of listening in and asking questions. I'm not quite sure how much people would get out of it. I'm not suggesting it's a substitute. You know, as soon as this is all over, I think just getting in on the floor is what you need. But I will, I will have a think about that. It's an interesting question. Thank I just want to say a massive thank you to you guys for giving up your time. Um, it's been brilliant speaking to you and so interesting to hear about your journeys and the work you've done in the industry. So um, a huge, huge thank you and to everybody um, who has tuned into Screen Careers today. Just to finish off, really, there's a couple of things that um, I, I think there has been some themes that have run throughout these four events that have taken us uh, right through the journey. Um, and there's lots that we've covered. I think somebody said in the chat that their brain hurts. And I get it because there is so much and there's so many different routes. But it's all about people and collaborating. And that's something that I think has come through loud and clear. This is a, a business where you're going to communicate with people. So communication skills are key research 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 everything who's doing what when and know what's going on be organized that's come through in every single one of the chats and it's a business so we've talked so much about budgets everything around making sure things run to budget and things run to time um, and being on it i think has come through from lots of people as well you know making sure that you're first there that you're not late that you are turning up with a really good attitude these are all things um, that have come out through the sessions whether it be in production creative post-production or technical um, but I want to thank all of the speakers through the four sessions and Siobhan and Lloyd and the team for organizing them so thank you so much and I'm going to hand back to Siobhan